Explanation of the diagram. The central triad represents love, wisdom, and crown, the trinity of God. The seven-pointed star, the seven rays issuing therefrom. The seven circles show the seven angelic worlds formed from the seven active principles. The names Cassiel, Michael, etc. are Kabbalistical names for the Sephiroth the secondaries or ruling intelligences who, after God, actuate the universe. While the words above and below show their attributes. Chapter 2. The Realm of Matter. Evolution. The term evolution is from the Latin e and volvo, which means to roll from or unroll, and the evolution of matter means precisely what the term implies, unfolding, expanding, opening, and evolving, the whole of which can be summed up in the word progression. Matter, per se, is the polar opposite of manifested spirit. It is the reaction of spiritual action. It is energy in a state of rest. It is force and motion in an exact state of equilibrium. In short, matter simply means solidified spirit. When two imponderable equal forces from opposite directions meet each other, both powers become polarized, force is resolved into inertia, motion is transformed into rest, in other words, spirit becomes matter, its refinement or its density depending upon its degree of etherealization. The progression and ultimation of the life force latent within matter must be accomplished by a process of unfoldment. The potentialities, in order to expand and put forth their infinite possibilities, must evolve. And this is so, because they have become incarnated by the opposite forces of enfoldment. But having become involved in the degradation of the material, by the fall, and cast into the bottomless pit, or crystallizing point in space, the only possible means of return to the original pure spiritual state is through the progressive cyclic pathways of material unfoldment. The evolution of matter, like everything else within the realms of manifested existence, must have some point of commencement. If matter is, as previously stated, but the manifestation of spirit, the negative ray externalized and in a state of crystallized inertia, then matter must be the first offspring of spirit, and both combined must comprise the all of all things. Yeah, even deity itself, for an infinite creator cannot get beyond his creation, nor exist apart from himself, because the great law of polar opposites is the direct emanation from his own divine nature. Consequently, he must also be governed by the self-same laws and principles which control his creative activities. <clears throat> and when traced to their source, we have seen how beautifully simple such primal laws are, wisdom and love, and, convertibly, male and female, positive and negative, activity and response. Briefly stated, there is but one law, one principle, one agent, and one word. This sacred law is sex a term wherein may be summed up the grand totalities of the infinite universe. Sex is dual and finds expression in the phallus and yoni of animated nature. This same sexual law operating throughout nature limits the sources from which our knowledge of nature can be obtained. In other words, there are but two sources from which knowledge of any kind is received. One is subjective, the other objective. The former gives us knowledge of the spiritual or causal side of the cosmos. The latter gives the material side, which is the world of effects, on account of its being evolved out of the former. As the poet hath said, The outward doth from the inward roll, and the inward dwells in the inmost soul. The great first cause has evolved out of himself the esoteric, or subjective world, and out of the subjective by a simple change of polarity, which at once brings forth a change of energy and substance, he has evolved the objective world. Therefore, the antecedents of the objective are to be found in the subjective world. We have now completed the cyclic outline of our present research, and, as a result, we know that the point of commencement in material evolution which we have thus far been seeking lies hidden within the realms of spirit, of which realm we have already spoken in chapter 1. 
In order to clearly comprehend nature's processes and the unfoldment of matter, a careful study of the seven creative principles is very necessary. Not studied as so many intelligencies or states of conscious life, but as seven principles or forces, which, through the unconscious and blind in their activities throughout their different spheres of operation, yet act striking strictly in harmony with each other as the refracted parts of a whole, fulfilling the creative design. These seven principles are not in themselves intelligent, but are simply powers directed by intelligence, just as the electric current is a power which, when governed by intelligence, becomes a medium for the expression of that intelligence, and capable of transmitting its master's thoughts and desires, instantaneously, to any part of the globe that has been prepared to receive them. The intelligence which directs these powers by the laws of harmony are the seven angelic worlds mentioned in the previous chapter, and as they are a perfect epitome of the divine law, it necessarily follows that the objective world of matter must be a perfect epitome, a solidified expression of its progenitors, and must contain within itself the latent attributes of its spiritual source. Powers, like individuals, are limited in their activities. For instance, before electricity can manifest itself as light or power, it must have something to act upon, a point of contact or report, and the point or place of manifestation. As stated in the above illustration of the electric current, the place and object of such phenomena must have been prepared for the expression of such power. Hence the necessity, if we may use such a term, of the objective world being a perfect epitome of and containing the latent attributes of the higher and more interior worlds of, of cause. If this were not so, the perfect evolution of matter would be an impossibility, because no subjective power, state, or principle can act or react upon an objective form unless a portion of itself lies within that form we must carry this line of reasoning a little further. Man, in his physical body, is a perfect epitome of the planet upon which he lives, while the celestial worlds find their perfect expression in his soul, and these worlds, in turn, are but the higher and more interior expression, not only of man's physical organism, but of the earth on which he lives. We see, therefore, how beautifully harmonious Mother Nature is, even in her most secret parts. She has made every known thing dependent upon a something else, and all things, therefore, are mutually dependent upon each other. Evolution is dependent upon involution, and objective upon the subjective, and man is dependent upon the earth. All contain the same eternal seven principles, the subjective in its imponderable essences, the objective in its solids, fluids and gases, and man, as the spiritual natural medium and, and meeting between the two great worlds, treasures up the seven mineral qualities in his body and their magnetic counterparts in the odylic sphere of his soul. In this recondite sense alone, we can fully understand the occult axiom of the ancients. Man is a microcosm, a universe within himself. The seven principles of nature correspond in their chemical affinities to the seven prismatic rays of the solar spectrum, and also present a perfect correspondence to the seven progressive states of manifestation, which have been very appropriately termed the life waves. It is these waves of cosmic life energies that carry out the great ascending scale of material evolution. When a wave commences, it, at once, sets in motion its evolutionary activities. These forces produce a series of responsive vibrations within that realm of force which forms its material correspondence, and thus acting and reacting upon each other like the ebb and flow of the tides, these forces produce another scene in the sublime drama of external life. These waves, seven in number, succeed each other in the following order. 1. The spiritual or realm of creation, symbol of the word. 2. The astral, or realm of design, symbolic of the idea. 3. The gaseous, or realm of force, symbolic of the power. 4. The mineral, or realm of phenomena, symbol of the justice. 5. The vegetable, or realm of life, symbolic of the beauty. 6. 
the animal or realm of consciousness, symbol of the love. 7. The human or realm of mind, symbolical of the glory. The student will form a clearer idea of these mighty principles if we travel over the same ground again in an explanatory matter. 1. The world of creation signifies the angelic world from which the original impulse first emanated. This spiritual impulse travels around the whole of the future orbit of the system about to be evolved, and prepares for the spaces for the reception and manifestation of a less ethereal force. 2. The world of design is the subjective cause world in the astral light, containing all the germs, forms, and ideals possible for that system to ultimate. 3. The world of cosmic force is the ever-circulating oceans of mundane, submundane, and supermundane forces, with which science is only just becoming acquainted in the forms of light, heat, magnetism, universal ether, electricity, and chemical, atomic, and solar energy. 4. The world of phenomena needs no explanation, it being the world of matter. 5. The world of life is the fluidic, the first forms of all things, that is, organic forms wherein there is life, are vegetables, and they originate in water, the grand matrix. 6. The world of consciousness. The first rudimentary expression of consciousness, generally termed instinct, manifests itself in the animal kingdom. It is intelligent mind expressing itself through the lower forms of etherealized matter. 7. The world of mind contains the human principle, man being the culminating point of material evolution. In this realm, the mind begins once more to assert its supremacy over matter. Here life conquers death, hence the very significant symbol of the Kabbalah, wherein this state is termed the glory. See chapters 5 and 6, La Clef. The processes of ultimation by the means of involution and evolution are inversely related to each other. The former, involution, is the original action, while the latter, evolution, is only the reaction, a necessary consequence of the former. Before attempting to explain those occult processes connected with the evolution of matter, which are silently at work within the unseen womb of nature producing the endless series of causes, the activities of which externalize themselves in an infinite variety of forms, it is necessary to briefly review the ideas expressed in Chapter 1, The Involution of Spirit, wherein we pointed out that, originally, our solar system was without form and void, Genesis 1-2. That is to say, it had no material objective shape, that previous to its external manifestation, it must have existed subjectively and in ideal form, and that this ideal form is but the symbolic expression of the ethereal forces projected during the evolution of thought. This is as far as we are permitted to go along the line of actual spiritual facts. But in carrying out the same chain of reasoning, we are led to the conclusion that if we could only penetrate, even for a single moment, the sacred adytum of nature's greatest of all mysteries, we should find that even thought itself was only due to the throbbing pulsations of the soul, and that these pulsations, in their turn, were but the sympathetic response, the expansion and contraction, of the spiritual respiration of, in harmonious obedience to the action and reaction of its divine ego. The primary ideas which we derive from chapter 1 are as follows. 1. That the macrocosm is the objective image of the divine subjective idea, and the microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm. 2. That the former, as a whole, is essentially without form, not only because it consists of such an infinite variety of forms, but because of the endless succession of progressive manifestations of those forms. Hence, being without essential form, it is unlimited. 3. That the latter, through a perfect epitome of the former, is finite, and such possesses a form as a symbol of its limitations. <laughs>